morning. We'd like to welcome you this morning to session 1B, moving from disparities to, to equity in health through community engagement. I'd like to go over a few housekeeping tips this morning uh, in ON24 before we start the presentation. We'd like to ask that you use Google Chrome, Safari, or Firefox this morning for optimal viewing. Please explore the toolbar in ON24 for additional features. They toggle on and off with a click, and you can resize any of the widgets that you open on your screen by clicking and dragging the bottom right-hand corner. For any technical issues that you may have, for self-help, please use the yellow question mark widget, or if you want to ask for assistance, please use the Q&A widget. Please submit any questions that you have for presenters today via the Q&A widget as well. Today we have disabled your camera and microphone. At this time, I would like to introduce Andrea Nicoli. She's with CalFresh Healthy Living, University of California, and she'll be getting us started this morning. Welcome, Andrea. Good morning and welcome to the session on moving from disparities to equity in health through community engagement. We both live history and make history. Historical trauma and institutional structural racism do not just happen. They are made and live in actions and deeds, policies and perceptions or misperceptions of people, events and history. The toxicity is insidious and pervasive. It affects health. Today, we will discuss how actions, deeds, policies, and practices that perpetuate racism have damaging, lasting effects on a community and its members' mental and physical health. These outcomes last generations and link to poverty. We will also discuss the vital importance of understanding a community and their history in order to authentically engage with community members in health education that can stimulate lasting positive impact. We have a series of four speakers that will offer insights on history, trauma, and its relationship to negative health outcomes. We will also discuss actions and practices that can help to alter negative health trajectories. Our panel includes Juliet McMullen, a professor of anthropology at UC Riverside. She is also interim dean for the College of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, and co-director for the Center for Health Disparities Research. Dr. McMullen specializes in medical anthropology and community-engaged research. Her work focuses on how health inequities are created and maintained and the possibility of change through community engagement. Jennifer Soberwein is a UC Agriculture and Natural Resources or UC a &R, Cooperative Extension Specialist in the Department of Environmental Science policy and management at UC Berkeley, an affiliated faculty at the Berkeley Food Institute. Her research and, and outreach program engages diverse stakeholders across the food system to examine barriers and co-create solutions to achieve healthy, equitable, culturally relevant, and sustainable food systems. Chatima Ganthavan is a Cooperative Extension Advisor in Nutrition, Family, and Consumer Sciences with UCANR. Her work is in nutrition education and evaluation, alternative methods of program delivery, and community garden development. Chatima administers the CalFresh Healthy Living UC Cooperative Extension Program in Riverside County and the Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program, or FNEP, 
in San Bernardino County. Lastly, Katie Johnson administers the CalFresh Healthy Living UC Cooperative Central Sierra Program and conducts applied research in the four rural counties of Calaveras, Amador, El Dorado, and Tuolumne. Her focus areas include rural food security, garden-enhanced nutrition education, food literacy, and breastfeeding support. We look forward to an interactive session with polling throughout the presentations. If you have any questions for the speakers, please use the Q&A widget and feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. Due to having four presenters, we will have Q&A at the end of the four presentations. Welcome to all speakers and viewers. Now we'll begin with Dr. McMullen from UC Riverside. Great, thank you for the introduction, Andra. I really appreciate it. Um, it's such an honor to be here today with such a, an amazing group of panelists to have this conversation with you. Um, before I move forward, I just wanna acknowledge where I am um, on the ancestral and current caretakers, the land um, of the Tongva and the Ahachaman peoples. Uh, and it's an honor always to be here visiting. Um, so as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about health disparities and the critical role that community engagement plays in health equity. And I come to you today as an ambiguously brown woman, as a child whose single mother received food stamps to make sure that my sister and I had food on the table. And as a mother who instilled a commitment of social justice to her daughter, in part through having her with me during my PhD field work in Hawaii, where we talked about land rights, the importance of Kalo, the taro plant, and how food plays a role in every aspect of life and equity. And so before I continue, um, it would be great if people as, uh, took up Andra's invitation to say good morning in the chat and share a little bit about where you're coming from. Uh, at the same time, I will also um, start a poll, a quick poll, just understanding uh, our various experiences with health disparities. So um, good morning to everyone in the chat, and then here's the poll. So it's always interesting to decide how long we should take for the poll. <laughs> Since uh, it's a shorter question, we'll go ahead and see the results. Ah, great. Uh, we have a lot of people right in between, um, but some new people as well as some very expert people in the audience. And it's so great to have everyone here because that's the way that we uh, can learn more and share our experiences with each other. And I believe that the work that you do as part of CalFresh is to address health disparities. So as I share definitions and examples of health disparities, I hope that you will begin to see yourself and your programs as part of this important work and as part of our path to health equity. So what are health disparities? Oftentimes we see numbers such as these, and these particular numbers are rates for native, the Native American population. These numbers call our attention to suffering and the differences between populations of people. So Native Americans right now have two times higher mortality from COVID, the, some of the highest rates of various cancers, 400 times more likely to be experiencing food insecurity and 2.4 times higher mortality from injury. Reporting rates such as these for many groups are a comparison between often Native, Latinx, Black, or other racially defined groups. 
a comparison to whites. And part of the problem is that comparisons fall into our long history of using race and biology as a source of the differences. And despite decades of science and more recently the Human Genome Project, which is also a decade or more long, uh, older, um, all of these demonstrate time and time again that the concept of race has no genetic or scientific basis. The idea of someone being biologically flawed rather than institutions being flawed continues to drive the interpretation for so many people of these numbers. And the numbers are very much a double-edged sword. They tell us that there is a problem, um, but if we reduce it to biology or to individual behaviors, then we're missing the core of health disparities. So Healthy People 2020 defines health disparities as, quote, a particular type of difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. Health disparities adversely affect groups of people who have systematically experienced greater obstacles to health based on their racial or ethnic group, religion, socioeconomic status, gender, age, mental health, cognitive sensory, or physical disability, sexual orientation or gender identity, geographic location, or other characteristics historically linked to discrimination or exclusion. Health disparities, who lives longer, are intimately linked to our social, economic, and environmental structures. So another quick question, making sure we're all on the same page. So this says health equity. It, it can also read health disparities. So health disparities focus primarily on changing which aspect? Our individual behaviors, the delivery of medical care, or systemic inequities? Let's see where we're at. Yes, systemic inequities are the primary focus uh, of health disparities or health equity. We can do some of the other things that are part of it, but the primary focus is really on what's going on in the system. So let's get a more in-depth view of what health disparities and social determinants of health uh, can actually look like. So you'll see this slide here um, is a really, I, I really appreciate this slide at so many levels. It was originally created um, by the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative, and I've seen so many people adapt it. I wanted to adapt it a little bit more to reflect Riverside. Um, but if you look at the top of the slide, so you have upstream and downstream effects. And starting with the downstream, this is where we often begin to focus our attention. This is where we see the numbers and notice that there's a problem. You know, so some of the problems are thinking around risk behaviors, smoking, poor nutrition, low physical activity, violence, alcohol and substance use. There's also disease and injury, communicable diseases, unintentional injuries, all leading to mortality. So when we examine, um, oh, excuse me, sorry. So when we look at these downstream effects, we often focus our programs in primarily changing this area and primarily changing individual behaviors. But if we go to the upstream area, so social inequities, institutional inequities, living conditions, these are the ways that we can begin to examine how we end up with the higher mortality rates for Native American populations. And we can see some of the effects of what has been called weathering. That is that the chronic exposure to stress and discrimination leading to an accelerated decline in physical health. 
So someone who's experiencing this chronic exposure to stress and discrimination, and maybe is 45, they'll have health conditions that are normally associated with someone who's 55. And we know that the life expectancy for Native Americans is almost 20 years less than others. So there's something more going on in the upstream effects. So where do these chronic exposures come from? Let's look at them, sort of thinking around access to food. And, um, and remember that Native Americans are having 400 times more likely to experience food insecurity. I also want to acknowledge that as I go through the slides in the social equity inequities, institutional inequities, and moving uh, to living conditions, that I am building on the work of Bonnie Duran and Edward Duran. So first, thinking about so social inequities, the box on your far, or, or my far left, <laughs> um, is looking at class, race, ethnicity, immigration status, uh, all those areas that health disparities mentioned. Uh, as affecting. And so thinking about Native Americans, the original encounters with colonists where Native American practices and life were systematically disassembled. And, you know, often we continue to see some of these actions today, the disassembling of how things are done uh, with the Dakota Pipeline Project and even lack of access to adequate funding during the pandemic. So there's something at the very core of our history that tells us that Native Americans need are to be treated differently. Uh, institutional inequities. There's a whole host of areas from business to higher education, schooling, uh, law, and uh, regulations. So when we look at institutional inequities in our history, we can think about economic co competition. So the colonists come and we have Native Americans and that competition over the resources led to a loss of, envir of environment for Native Americans, uh, ways of gathering food for physical sustenance and relationships with the environment that provides spiritual sustenance were destroyed. The invasion period, this is an era where the US government carried out a policy of extermination through military force. So if people were not killed, they were removed from their traditional homelands. And then moving even forward, we had into the 1850s that starts the reservation period where native people were forced to live within the confines of reservations. And this prevented them from moving around to gather sustenance, connect with relatives. And the forced relocation severely restricted access to traditional food systems that historically included regional specific hunting, gathering, fishing, and farming. The loss of the traditional food sources also resulted in dependence on federal government programs and commodity foods that included the distribution of foods such as lard, canned meats, white flour, salt, and sugar. And who can forget those large blocks of processed cheese? While the commodity foods have gotten better, even now, native, when Native people go to gather foods on their ancestral lands, they are asked for permits by park rangers or told that they're not allowed to be there and take anything at all. So the disruption continues to this day. Thinking around uh, living conditions, housing, the physical environment, um, we can look at the boarding school period. And this was a systematic attack on Native family and intergenerational support. Removing children from parents, placing them in distant boarding schools, and while, the boarding, while in the boarding schools, children were forbidden to speak native languages, practice native religion, or to do anything that was perceived to draw on native knowledge systems. So you have a whole disruption of the transfer of knowledge about how to gather food, how to cook food, how to, to be in the world. It's completely disrupted both by taking the children out and um, by, by the physical genocide. So this is a kind of cultural genocide as well. 
And today, some of some states even continue to incentivize social workers to remove Native children from their families. And finally, during the 1950s, many Native people were relocated from reservations to large cities. So again, the compounding of the cultural genocide uh, and lack of access to healthy environments and uh, their families and again, their ways of knowing. So this history is a succession of collective traumas that were focused on Native Americans and where each level of our society is involved. So social inequities, institutional inequities, living conditions, all leading to risk behaviors, disease, injury, and mortality. So those are the various levels of social determinants of health and health disparities. And so what can we do? Well, let's look at the bottom part of the slide. Community partnerships and strategic initiatives. Other presenters will show you how this works on their ground in their presentations. But these are the areas where multi-level engagement can begin to make change in the health disparities. These are the areas where we can gather together as community, as partners uh, to really begin changing the way that our institutions work and the ways that we think about inequity. But all of this has to be done in collaboration with communities. Communities know where the problems and sticking points are. They know their own struggles. To come in and simply implement a program is part of the upstream social inequities that feed into the downstream effects. So intensive engagement addresses social determinants of health by including community in developing responses to problems, to build their capacity to engage and to advocate and engage at all levels. And so I often wonder what would it look like if we uh, very much focused on uh, food so sovereignty, for example. So now that you know something about what health disparities and social determinants of health look like, um, and the various levels that affect them, let's ask a question about your own work. So the primary focus of your work in health disparities addresses change at which level? So you can have community, institutional, individual, policy, or other, and you can check all that apply. Oh, it's only letting you check one. Okay, apologies for that. <laughs> so check the one that's most important. Hopefully you got that first. So most people are already working at the community level and then there's institutional level and individual level policy, the range, you know, so you're really focusing on addressing this at all levels and that's what it's gonna take for us to make the change. Um, so really engaging the community and then not leaving out all the other levels, but letting the community drive those kinds of questions about where in that um, process you want to intervene. And I think it's really important for us to name the areas where our programs address, because in naming them, that's how we can collectively begin to shift toward health equity. And so when we think about health equity, uh, this is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. Achieving health equity requires valuing everyone equally with focused and ongoing societal efforts to address avoidable inequalities, historical and contemporary injustices, and the elimination of healthcare disparities. And so again, 
a key way to eliminate them is through collaborating with our communities in ways that they can be equal partners in all that we do. And again, the other panelists will show you so much more about what they're doing, but I wanna share a little bit um, about the work that uh, my group has done, uh, the Chihung Piyong Inach project, the gathering of good minds. Um, so Chihung Piyong Inach uh, is a Serrano for gathering of good minds, and it was a name that was gifted to us by Mr. Ernest Siva. And the Chihung Piyong Inach project is a community engaged project where we engaged our partners in deciding what they wanted to talk about, um, what the issues were for them. We also worked on capacity building so that they could be equal partners at all levels of the project with us. And this included even sharing um, the majority or half of our budget, almost half of our budget. Universities charge a little bit more <laughs> in directs, but most of it was split half and half with our community partners. And in our conversations, we learned that they wanted to address questions of historical trauma and soul wounds in a way that would change how the physicians worked with them and their patients. So this collaboration with Riverside San Bernardino Indian Health was really focused on helping physicians understand the histories of the people that they're serving. Because oftentimes physicians come in and they have no idea locally or more broadly uh, why they're seeing higher rates, why um, their patients might not trust them uh, and tell them everything right away. Uh, so what we decided to do is to address the problem uh, through curriculum change uh, and uh, creating a podcast that would really address questions around historical trauma and soul wounds. So those institutional level issues. And so this is just a small uh, sampling of the podcasts, the episodes that we have. So we started our uh, podcast with a conversation with community members, asking them about their history and what they wanted their physicians to know about them and their healthcare and how they were treated and why they don't trust institutions. Then we also had an episode that defined historical trauma. Some of it you heard today. Um, there's more interviews in there as well from community members and what it means to them and uh, how they understand that society values or doesn't value them. So that chronic discriminatory stress. We have a great episode on boarding schools, um, stories shared from people who had gone to boarding schools or from their family members who were in boarding schools. And that's a really mixed bag um, because some people, it allowed them to go on to higher education, whereas others were um, severely abused and traumatized by the experience. And then we have an episode on Tem the Temecula Treaty, which uh, talks about the massacre of, uh, of Kuya and um, Serrano people living in the area, in Temecula area, and the failure to enact uh, treaties that they had thought were going to be signed. We also have an episode on high rates where we talk a bit about weathering. So I wanted to give you just a moment to listen to uh, some of part of the podcast. Battery tied. Connected to Juliet's iPhone. Critical. People like to separate medicine off as something different, but to recognize. People think of uh, native medicine only as herbal medicine, which cer certainly is true and lives today in all the native communities that I know of. So uh, that, that survives. But what people do not know is this spiritual connection with them the environment with the land, with the creation, and how that uh, influences 
uh, people historically. I always feel that that is the foundation of our understanding of any tribe, understanding something about their traditional stories, uh, creation songs. So, yeah. yes. Yeah. And so that link to the land is so important for what we are going to focus on today. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and your health is, is based on your relationship with the earth and these places. This is, um, this is extremely important that, that your sacred mountain, your sacred places, your former village sites, your graves of your, your people, that they are all cared for. And that's in accordance with the laws that came to the people at the beginning of time about how to act and interact, not just with each other, but also with animals, with plants, with water, and then to take care of it. You, you as a human being were expected to take care of the land. So that is just part of an interview with um, Professor Cliff Trapser about Native healing and, again, um, the role of the government in Native lives. So to sum up, rather than focusing on individual behaviors of the people who are experiencing the health disparities, we used community engagement to make change at an institutional, medical, and, and individual level to provide physicians with the skills to name and address appropriately the mistrust and unequal health outcomes that they see with their patients and to collaboratively work with them to support their delivery of care. There's much to be said about naming processes, naming actions. Only in recognizing them can we begin to change how we provide services, how we improve health outcomes, and how we ameliorate health disparities and achieve health equity. But we can only do this if we collaborate with our community as equal partners in all levels of our programs. So thank you so much for allowing me to share this work with you. And I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Jennifer Sowerwine, who will share her exciting collaborations with community engaged work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Juliet. Um, oh, here's a, your last slide. Um, more information about those beautiful podcasts. I, yeah, I look forward to listening to more of those as well. Um, so again, I just really appreciate the framing that you've offered, Juliet, about how to reduce health inequities and also, um, you know, really providing that historical context of ongoing impacts of cultural genocide. Uh, on Native American communities. And, and with that, I'm going, in my presentation, I'm gonna talk about, um, sort of continue this conversation around the value and importance of community engagement in addressing health disparities. Um, I'll start off by sharing some key principles and approaches to community engagement, and then share some lessons learned from a participatory research and community engagement project um, designed to enhance tribal health, food security, and food sovereignty in the Klamath River Basin. Uh, this project was conducted in partnership with the Kuduk, Yurok, and Klamath River tribes through funding from the USDA, um, where more, uh, the majority of the, the funding actually was dedicated to the three tribes um, partnering on the project. And my hope is that today you'll come away with a deeper understanding of how a community-centered approach to research, planning, program development, and evaluation can reveal new insights into health disparities and contribute to more culturally relevant programs with more impactful outcomes. Um, but before I get started, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the original peoples upon the lands um, where I reside. Um, Berkeley sits in the territory of Huchun, uh, the unceded ancestral lands of the Chocheno speaking Ohlone people. As a member of the Berkeley community, I recognize that this land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma, Lishan, and other Ohlone descendants. And I recognize that I and all members of the Berkeley community uh, continue to benefit from this use and ongoing occupation of the land. I also want to acknowledge that it's precisely this legacy of occupation, as Juliet was mentioning in her presentation, um, that is one of the many factors that contributes to the ongoing health disparities among Native communities in California. According to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, in order to achieve health equity, we must first identify the root causes of health disparities. 
And then we work towards implementing changes in policies, systems, practices, and the environment to try to reduce the inequities. We have to engage in ongoing evaluation and monitoring of our programs, including course correction as needed to be able to enhance equity in opportunities and resources. And most importantly, we must actively engage those most affected by disparities in the identification, the design, the implementation, and evaluation of promising solutions. So why does a community-centered strategy matter? Um, why is it important to actively engage those most affected by disparities? Well, most conventional health assessments focus on collecting and aggregating similar data points to allow for generalization of findings across communities. This focus on generalizable data collection, like all federal and state agency data sets, includes indicators that may not be designed or developed by the impacted communities themselves. And they tend to focus on negative attributes, such as deficit, difference, and disparity. This approach limits communities' ability to have data collected about their own individual and unique social context. A community-centered approach, on the other hand, it values and promotes diverse ways of knowing about land, about food, about bodies and communities, including community assets, uh, which enable communities to tell their own unique story and imagine their own distinct futures. So how do we as researchers and service providers actively engage communities in identifying health disparities and increasing health equity? There are countless approaches to community-engaged research, planning, and evaluation that have emerged over the past few decades. These new approaches include uh, citizen science, for example, feminist participatory research, participatory action research, which you'll hear about uh, in the next two presentations, as well as community-based participatory research, which, which is the field that I practice in, among others. And all of these approaches seek to broadly address the failures of top-down research and interventions that have failed to achieve the intended outcomes of the interventions. They strive to equitably involve community members in all aspects of the research, the planning, the education, and the evaluation processes. And they tend to move beyond research for generating knowledge itself toward integrating knowledge learned with and from the community and translating that into education and social action to improve health and reduce health disparities. So when considering how to engage with one's community, there are a number of key principles that are common across all approaches. The first is this idea of preflection, where you take time to learn about the community that you hope to engage. As Juliet was mentioning, you really need to deeply understand their history, their cultural and spiritual practices and gender norms, the ways in which their or communities are organized, um, their language and literacy levels, and their cultural food ways. And it's important to take time to build relationships and trust, understanding the people with whom and for whom you are working. It's important to understand why there may be mistrust in our organizations and institutions, as Juliet mentioned. And it's important to take time to value community knowledge and perceptions. And it's also important to keep showing up. It takes time to build relationships. Another core principle is this idea of deep listening and respect. One of my colleagues um, with the Klamath tribes, Perry McDaniel, uh, shared that we were born with two ears and one mouth. We need to listen twice as much as we speak. And that's really stuck with me. Uh, a couple other principles. One is this idea of reversals of learning. It was developed by Robert Chambers uh, in, put forth in his book, Putting a Last First, where researchers take off their expert hats and become learners and facilitators rather than directors and teachers. It also draws on this idea of reversals of power. And that comes from Paolo Ferri's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, where as researchers and service providers, we need to recognize and challenge the power imbalances and really have an explicit focus on amplifying marginalized voices. So this gets at these questions around, you know, who's defining the research problems? Who's generating the analyses? 
representing the, the analyses and who owns and acts on the information that is sought. So now I'm going to talk about how I've applied these principles in a collaborative food sovereignty project in the Klamath River Basin, which you can see here. Uh, since 2012, I've had the privilege and honor uh, to work closely with the Kaduk tribe in partnership with the Yurok and Klamath tribes and their ancestral territories along the stretch of the Klamath River. Uh, it originates in southern Oregon near Crater Lake, and you can see it extends down through northern California and empties out into the Pacific Ocean near the town of Klamath. Um, we've had the great fortune of collaborating on several research, education, and outreach projects um, together to better understand the vast health disparities and co-create solutions centering on tribal identified priorities. So again, to really bring home this importance of uh, in order to understand contemporary health disparities in our communities, it's really important to look to the past. Historically, the Klamath Basin had an absolute abundance of cultural foods, fibers, including fish, acorn, elk, that were stored by the tribes, as Juliet had discussed. Yet according to the USDA, it's now considered a food desert. Settler colonization had a devastating impact on the lives, the livelihoods, and cultural foodways of the tribes, including genocidal land theft and forced assimilation, including the boarding schools, as Juliet had discussed. And that had a lasting impact in physical, cultural, and spiritual health. Dramatic changes to the forests and fisheries resulting from extractive industries, including dams, as you can see here in the middle picture, mining, logging, and fire suppression, as well as the criminalization of cultural burns that were used to restore the land and to promote uh, the abundance of cultural foods. All of that has led to habitat degradation and reduced availability of cultural foods. Tribes in the region today are some of the poorest and most food insecure with high rates of unemployment and limited opportunities for youth. And they're also experiencing some of the highest rates of obesity, diabetes, and other diet-related diseases. Furthermore, data on food insecurity among native populations are often, um, is often very limited. There's this idea of the asterisk nations where in national data sets, there's often insignificant um, number of data or quantity of data to be able to do statistical significant analyses. And so um, it renders them essentially invisible to funders and policymakers. And national measures, including the Household Food Security Survey module, um, they don't account for cultural variables or cultural perspectives in these assessments of food security. Yet in spite of this adversity, there is incredible resilience and continuity of cultural foodways as seen here on the left uh, is Ron Reed, a, a dear friend of mine and his son Ryan, their traditional dip net fisherman fishing for salmon uh, in the, their traditional fishing hole. And on the right, filleting salmon in preparation for roasting it around the fire. I wanted to il illustrate this example as just the importance of this intergenerational learning going on that's so important for maintaining cultural, mental, spiritual, and physical health. So with this backdrop, our project um, uh, focused on research, education, and outreach sought to understand the experience and predictors of Native American food insecurity and to identify and support solutions to enhance Native health, food security, and food sovereignty through tribal-led solutions. So our ultimate goal was not only to increase food security or access to and consumption of fresh, healthy, and culturally appropriate foods, but also to support tribal goals to restore sovereignty over their food system. And it's important to make this distinction between food security, which is simply the state of having access to sufficient, affordable, and nutritious food. And that implies through purchasing or food assistance. Whereas sovereignty is the right to culturally relevant foods and the right to define one's own food system, essentially how they acquire their food. So this, in the context of the Klamath, includes rights to practice traditional land stewardship, such as cultural burning, as you can see here in this image, uh, to promote the abundance of culturally important foods, such as elk, salmon, and mushrooms. This idea and this notion of indigenous food sovereignty is also important in the indigenous context, in that it's not just focused on rights to land and food and the ability to control a production system, 
but also relates to the responsibilities to them, which encompass cultural, ecological, and spiritually appropriate relationships with all elements of those food systems. Again, it's important to understand this difference when we're seeking to reduce disparities around healthy food access. So now I'll talk a bit about the research design. Our, um, our team uh, designed uh, this research using community-based participatory research approach in which we adapted standard food security assessments with our tribal partners uh, to include cultural measures of food security, including access to traditional foods, such as acorn and salmon, as you can see here. Uh, it included intergenerational knowledge sharing, um, such as through hunting and gathering, and it also included food sharing networks. We also asked for community perspectives on barriers and solutions to food insecurity. And uh, in doing so, we adapted several toolkits, including the USDA Community Food Security Toolkit, which some of you may be familiar with, as well as the First Nations Food Sovereignty Toolkit, and the Whole Measures Toolkit for Planning and Evaluation. And for more information about these toolkits, you can find them in the resource portal. Um, we administered the survey to um, the Karuk, Yurok, Hoopa, and Klamath tribes and had over 700 responses. It was one of the largest data sets of food insecurity among Native people. So not surprisingly, our results revealed significant health disparities, confirming even higher rates of poverty, health challenges, and food insecurity than previously reported. We found 92% of all households experienced some level of food insecurity, with more than half experiencing very low food security. Um, and that includes uh, reduction in size of meals or skipping meals in the last year. We found over four times the poverty rate compared with national data and nearly nine times the food insecurity rate and five times the reliance on food assistance, again, compared with the national average. What's most interesting, though, is that by integrating these cultural dimensions into our food security measurement, we also found that having access to Native foods and access to intergenerational knowledge learning um, were strong predictors of food security. In addition, we found that 40% of all respondents relied on hunting, fishing, gathering, and using home canned foods to minimize their own food insecurity signifying the importance of self-determination and food sovereignty. However, um, only 7% of the respondents got all the native foods they wanted at all times, and the majority never or rarely did uh, due to legal and environmental barriers. Um, nearly all respondents indicated they wanted more access to native foods. Um, and these, what's most important, kind of a take home from this is that the results show how food, so how food security is framed and by whom shapes not only our understanding of the experience and predictors of food security, but also the kinds of interventions or solutions that are proposed. So by integrating this cultural perspective, our data revealed that supporting improved access to native or traditional foods is likely to improve household food security in this context. Our data also suggests that conventional solutions to food insecurity, such as food assistance, while it's an important stopgap measure, is not enough to achieve food security. In fact, 84% of those who were dependent on food assistance still worried about running out of food. And 20% still relied, um, or 20% of those who relied on food assistance did so because native foods were not available. When we asked for recommendations on how to improve food security or the food system more broadly, no one asked for more food assistance, although some asked for it to be healthier. Rather, people's responses centered around food sovereignty and self-determination such as increasing access to traditional foods through eco-cultural restoration on the landscape, improving food self-reliance through skill building, gardening, and youth workforce development, having tribal members uh, teach classes themselves on harvesting and processing cultural foods, such as acorns, as you can see here on the left, eels in the middle, and manzanita berries um, shown on the right. And all of this really centering around the promotion of intergenerational learning. One of the most impactful activities and outcome 
and outcome included the development and implementation of a K through 12 sustainable native food system curriculum. So as Juliet mentioned, uh, the educational system is potentially one of the social determinants of health, and yet there is very little um, uh, knowledge or uh, information shared about indigenous perspectives. So developed by my colleague, Lisa Hillman, this K through 12 curriculum included over 100 lesson plans teaching youth about their own history and culture of the Kaduk tribe and the interconnections between land, culture, health, and sovereignty, all in alignment with the English language arts common core standards. The content focuses on teaching traditional values of respect, identity, belonging, and cultural responsibility. It integrates Kaduk language and cultural foods improving native youth confidence in their studies and instilling pride in cultural heritage and traditional knowledge. Further outcomes included increased academic performance and greater parent and community involvement in the education, all of which are important social determinants of health. So to illustrate one of the many activities that strengthened youth leadership and pride in cultural foodways, I'd like to share one of the videos that was designed, produced, and edited by the youth as part of their final project titled Making Manzanita Berry Cider. We were told yesterday, reminded by Grant's mom, we should be having good thoughts and be nice to each other. Whenever you're making something, whenever you're processing or when you're gathering, if you don't have good thoughts and you're not putting your best into it, no gossiping, teasing each other, cussing around, don't bother doing it. If you can't do it with good thoughts and, and kindness in your heart, then you shouldn't be doing it or making it for other people. So, you guys can kind of figure it out, but I think kind of it's going to be like a twisty, crushy thing that I think is helpful, but I'm like a bang. Okay, if you are here. So we're gonna resort this one. Does everyone see the seeds are in it? Okay, where's the big sister? Manchinita Fussip Fussip
Wonderful. So I hope you all enjoyed that film, really demonstrating the, the power and the vision and the excitement of the children, the intergenerational learning, the affirmation of cultural foods and identity. And so just to conclude, I'd like to um, bring our attention back to the value of community engagement in both assessing and addressing health disparities. As seen through our case study, community engagement can lead to more robust understandings of health disparities and culturally relevant solutions to advance health equity. Some key things to keep in mind are that community engaged research, planning, and evaluation allows communities to be at the center of knowledge production, identifying the problem, defining the research questions, interpreting the results, and identifying solutions based on the results in real time. By engaging tribal communities in our research, we were able to identify key barriers to community health rooted in ongoing legacies of colonization, including environmental degradation and diminished food sovereignty. On the flip side, we also identified important cultural determinants of health, including access to traditional foods, intergenerational learning, and culturally affirming curriculum and education. And finally, uh, community engagement can strengthen community capacity to identify and address health disparities themselves, such as restoring habitat to increase abundance of cultural foods. As you can see here, Kathy McCovey doing on the left with Indian potatoes. It can also uh, promote intergenerational cultural food programming, such as the video you saw and the workshop uh, led by tribal elder Laverne Glaze on the right, an elk canning workshop. And it also uh, it involves restoration of both traditional food practices, including salmon roasting and home gardens, all of which can promote greater food sovereignty. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all for listening and I'd like to acknowledge the invaluable contributions of all the project partners and funders. And for more information about this project, as well as resources mentioned throughout the talk, uh, be sure to check out the portal. So now I'd like to pass it on to Chutima Ganthavorn from UC Cooperative Extension. three examples from our Cowfish Healthy Living program um, that may be seen as helping to move from disparities to um, equity in health. So our work is focused on community gardens and using these gardens to drive community engagement. Um, but before we get there, I would like to ask you to uh, respond to this poll. What brings you to this session today? Please take a minute to respond. And um, if you select other reasons, um, if you could share in the chat what your reason um, might be, that would be great. Okay, let's see. I'm going ahead to go ahead and push to the audience. Okay. Wow. Okay. So we have 62% um, administrator in the audience, 12% um, about um, educator and field staff already working, doing this work related to health equity. Um, and then 25% educator and field staff wanting to learn more about health equity. So thank you very much for responding to the poll. Um, so our first garden project started at the Community Sediment Association in the city of Riverside. Um, this is an underserved area that is close to 80% Latinx uh, population. We were offering nutrition education there at this location occasionally, but didn't really engage with the community until we were asked at one of the CNAP meetings um, if we could help CSA to revitalize their existing garden. 
And this was about the time when um, SNAP-Ed started to focus on social ecological model and policy systems and environmental change. So back in um, 2014. Um, our approach was to form a core planning team consisting of the director and staff at CSA, our own team, the CalFresh Healthy Living UCCE and UC Master Gardener program. And we were lucky to be able to get three Master Gardeners to join us. Um, we had lots of meetings. We got together and started working on getting the garden ready for a planting day. Um, we invited local families to participate and the event turned out to be quite successful. So over the next few years, um, the partnership grew and we got a mini grant from Wood Street's green team to purchase fruit trees and organize a tree planting event and people came for that. Um, later, the East Side Youth Zone um, Collaborative and facilitated by the local health department at the time, gave us a grant from Kaiser Permanente um, to expand the garden. And this project took about a year and with the help of students, volunteers uh, from UCR Garden and UC Riverside, we converted the MD lawn area near the street into 18 garden beds. And the next project was to paint the mural and the Riverside County Health Foundation connected us with a local artist who volunteered his time to help out. And as you can see, um, our work as CSA is built on partnerships. Okay, so this slide uh, shows a timeline spanning from 2014 to today. And um, you can see how the community involvement expanded as well. Uh, people in the community help with the planting twice a year um, during spring and winter. And um, the first year we conducted garden education with children in the after school program. And then to get um, more community involvement, to get the adults to come back, we started a monthly garden club for adults. Um, and we provided nutrition education, cooking demonstrations, gardening lessons, and we kept that going every year. After the garden expansion in 2016, the garden club members were given their own plot to increase a sense of ownership. And the following year, uh, we got the community involved in the mural painting. The garden club members came up with the concept ideas of what they want to see on the mural. We gave that to the artist and he did a sketch and um, the community, and then we organized a planting, a painting day and the community came and helped with the painting. Um, in 2018, we partnered with the Riverside Community Health Foundation to bring the Leadership Academy training to CSA. And eight club members went through the training and graduated from the program. And then to help them work on their leadership skills, uh, we started a garden club council in 2019. The council was able to organize a garden sign making event and a potluck before COVID put everything on hold. Okay, so after CSA, we had the opportunity to add two more garden projects. Um, one at the nearby neighborhood at Riverside Faith Temple, and this is an African-American church, and another in Eastern Coachella Valley on an Indian reservation um, of the Torres Martinez, that's a Korea Indian tribe. The California Healthy Places Index gave these communities very low HPI score and this is on a scale of 0 to 100, with 100 indicating healthy living conditions. And so the CSA community gets a score of 6.7%, Riverside Faith Temple, 4.9%, and the Torres Martinez, 5.8%. So these are the communities that are experiencing disparities. So at um, Riverside Faith Temple, basically we're trying to repeat the process by starting with a core planning team, inviting UC Master Gardeners to help assess the soil and garden conditions. And we help the church apply for a small grant uh, from the city of Riverside Economic Development Agency. 
uh, to put in garden boxes. And um, we also partner with the Inland Empire Job Corps for student volunteers to help with garden cleanup. And this garden um, is about one and a half acre in size. So it's huge and we're just starting. And so we still have a long way to go. So at the Torres Martinez Tribe, it's a little bit different. Uh, we got started there with the seed grant from CDSS through the Public Health Institute. And this grant was for a YPAR project, a Youth Participatory Action Research Project. But it actually initiated our partnership with the Tribal Grant Administration, which led to our joint application for the USDA Farm to School Planning Grant um, that was funded in 2019. Um, before the COVID-19 lockdown, we were able to take tribal members on a farm tour and started the garden planting with tribal youth and seniors and last year, the California Rural Indian Health Board um, became a partner and gave us a five-year grant to continue this work. So now I have a um, short video that I would like to show. Um, let's see. The CalFresh Healthy Living Program at UC Cooperative Extension is working with ethnic communities to transform their environment by implementing a community garden. Adults and minors dug and planted seeds and various vegetable plants in this community garden located in a popular Latino neighborhood in Riverside. Plantamos las matitas de chile, tomate, semillitas. Es comidita que, que nos sirve de las verduras, pues. Y otra de que, pues... Ayudar pues a para que los niños tengan noción, tengan, manden en la calle o algo para que tengan que se diviertan a tirar sus plantitas. The garden has been bringing people in this low resource community together to address healthy food access and learn about healthy eating and nutrition. It has grown over the years and is now a place for families to get together to celebrate healthy living. The second garden is located in what used to be a vacant lot in an African-American community. I would like to see it just a, a, a complete food force, uh, a source of food that didn't wouldn't cost anybody anything, and uh, something for people that don't have anything to do, a place to put their hands, to get their hands in the dirt, and accomplish something. The third of these gardens is in the heart of the community of the Torres Martinez tribe of the Cahuilla Desert Indians. In the Avutem, Garden of the Elders, members of this tribe gather to sow bushes of edible vegetables and herbs. They've made us aware that there are resources. I think that's the biggest impact is they've made us aware and there's a lot more help that we, that we really know about. Together, a&R programs and diverse ethnic organizations are working to address the lack of healthy food access that can result in overweight, obesity, chronic diseases, and sometimes premature death. Where we live, we don't have a lot of choices for healthy food. It's a benefit for everyone, for the kids, because it's fruits or things fresh that you can have in your house. Okay, um, I hope you like that. I hope the video gave you a better feel for community involvement um, and that they want to engage with us. Um, now I'd like to conclude with this message from the National Academy of Medicine, um, which said, I'm gonna read this. Um, it will take local, state, and national leadership in the public and private sectors to improve the underlying conditions of inequity, and that will take time. However, there is great promise in communities that are taking action against health inequities across the United States. The CalFresh Healthy Living Program is in a good position to lead um, community-based and community-driven community solutions. So this report 
um, points out nine factors or social determinants of health that are drivers of health inequity. Um, our garden work is addressing um, three factors. One is physical environment um, by building a new garden or revitalizing and maintaining an existing one. We not only improve the look of the community, but also increase healthy access. The second one is social environment. By bringing people in the community together, you increase bonding and building of new relationships and teamwork. And the third one is education. By uh, providing training to improve health literacy and gardening skills, people are empowered um, to take better care of themselves and their own health. And now to get to the red target, which is healthier, more equitable, communities, we need three elements. One um, in blue there, one is fostering multi-sector collaboration. Second in green um, is increasing community capacity to shape outcomes. And third uh, in orange is making health equity a shared vision and value. Um, looking back at our work, um, I think we have done well with the first two elements. We have had great partners and have worked together to increase community capacity. Going forward, I think we just need to be more mindful about the third element and start framing or reframing our work through the lens of health equity. So um, lastly, I would like to acknowledge my team and our UC ANR, UC collaborators for helping with these projects. And to all our community partners and grant funders, students and volunteers, I would like to say thank you. Um, we're on this journey together and can't do it with them. Okay, and that's all I have. So now I'm going to uh, Move this along to our last presenter, Katie Johnson from um, UC Cooperative Extension in Central Sierra. Thank you, Chitima. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am the Nutrition Science of Family and Consumer Sciences Advisor in the Central Sierra, um, which means I administer our CalFresh Healthy Living UC Cooperative Extension program across four counties. And I really wanna thank all of the speakers um, that have already spoken today and provided so many good examples and such good background. Um, following on that, I really wanna accomplish two main things with my time today. And that is to provide an overview of how our CalFresh Healthy Living program has identified and targeted the reduction of disparities in one particular community, and also how community engagement plays a part in that work. Um, but I also wanna make the point that reducing health disparities is truly central to our mission, all of our mission in CalFresh Healthy Living. Um, at the beginning of this presentation, Dr. McMullen said she hopes we all consider reducing health disparities to be part of our work. And I really want to reinforce that idea. So um, this is the SNAPED evaluation framework. And um, I really wanna start by acknowledging that for all the reasons we've already talked about today, uh, we know disparities are not just going to go away on their own without intentionally addressing them. Serving an area at large isn't enough. We need to target disparities specifically if we want to reduce them. Um, and reducing disparities is in fact what we're charged to do in SNAP-Ed. So this is the SNAP-Ed framework that guides all of our work from the federal level. Uh, and I don't expect you to be able to read this tiny print here, um, but just know this is all of the types of things that we do, the results we're aiming to see uh, along that side panel. And I wanna draw your attention to this little section here that refers to the population results we're trying to see. So those are things like diet quality, healthy meals, all of the other good things we're working towards within SNAP-Ed. Um, and let me switch slide here. 
What it says in tiny little print down there under population results is trends and reduction in disparities. So our fundamental mission is not just to improve rates or trends in healthy eating, diet quality, or other outcomes. It's also to reduce disparities in all of those areas. And this is truly central to what we're aiming to do in SNAP-Ed. Um, I think sometimes we don't talk about that enough. We talk a lot about rates and trends and overall results, but um, I really hope um, we all consider and talk a little bit more about our mission in SNAP-Ed being specifically to reduce disparities. So I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll here next. If you guys can participate, um, before we can target disparities, we have to know where they are. So I'd like to get a sense for what you all are currently doing locally. Um, we all have access to data in pairs, but how many of us are using our data through pairs or other sources to address on the local level who your program's reaching and who it might not be reaching? Um, and I'll give everybody just a few more seconds. Please participate in this poll. But also, I want to um, just give a quick reminder that you are welcome to put any questions you might have for any of the presenters today, not just me, but anyone who came before as well, into the Q&A box. And hopefully, we are going to have a few minutes at the end to answer your questions. So all right, we're going to wrap up the poll and see results. Um, and we have a pretty, we have a pretty even mix um, of where you guys are all in terms of looking at data. I think it's interesting. No one seems to have said that they don't think it's their job to assess this. So that's great and, and really encouraging to see. Thank you for sharing that. Um, now I want to move on to share an example of how our CalFresh Healthy Living UC Cooperative Extension Program has targeted disparities in El Dorado County. So these are some statistics from the county as a whole. Um, overall, it's actually one of the more healthy counties in the state. 17 out of 58 uh, ranked in the 2020 county health rankings. Uh, the median household income is over 80,000. The federal poverty rate is under 10%. Um, it is predominantly white, uh, almost 80% non-Hispanic white. Um, but if we drill down and look a little bit more closely at the South Lake Tahoe area specifically, um, we start to see some differences emerging. So Tahoe is a geographically isolated and very high cost of living area. I know that that would surprise every, anyone. It's uh, obviously a vacation destination, a beautiful place that many people visit every year. Um, and if we look at the, the data though, the household income is actually quite a bit lower than the county as a whole. The poverty rate's higher. Uh, proportionally, there are a much bigger share of Hispanic or Latinx um, residents who live there. And looking even closer at that specific ethnic group within the South Lake Tahoe area, um, we can see that the disparities are really even more pronounced. So what we have pictured here are the census tracts that include the metro South Lake Tahoe area. So when you go to visit South Lake Tahoe and you can kind of see a road running along up close to the lake there, um, there's a lot of very nice hotels, wonderful restaurants. Um, you know, it's a beautiful and very wealthy seeming area. But for the Latinx community, uh, this area is actually low income census tract designated. Um, all but one of the public schools in this area are designated low income, free and reduced price meal eligible. And well, there are other indicators we could look at for this area for health disparities. I'm sharing this info today because I think it's a good example of how disparities can hide in plain sight. Um, I'm sure most people don't necessarily think of South Lake Tahoe as a low income area in need of targeted resources. But it's really important to remember that not everyone in an area benefits equally from the resources and amenities around them. Um, so an intentional approach is needed in South Lake Tahoe. A community-wide blanket approach is not appropriate here um, if we truly want to reduce disparities. So I'm sorry, I realize my slide did not advance on the last one, but this is the picture I was talking about of this South Lake Tahoe area right along the lake. 
Um, so how our program is moving to target disparities is by concentrating resources um, for the area generally and particularly the Latinx community there. Uh, we have um, really actively sought a lot of partnerships to increase area resources. Um, the UC4H program, UC Davis Center for Regional Change, the school district, um, our California Healthy Living State Office, uh, many other partners um, have helped us to concentrate support in that particular area. And um, we really work together with all these partners to take a comprehensive approach, um, aiming to reach participants in different areas of their lives. We reach people at schools very often. Schools are important community hubs. So we provide in-school education, parent education, uh, Harvest of the Month programming, cooking lessons. Um, these are all wonderful types of programming we use to serve the community. Um, but also increasingly, we are making youth engagement a large part of our work there. And in youth engagement, we really aim to move from serving youth to engaging youth. Um, youth are important community members, and it's really important to provide them with options that let them determine what their priorities are in terms of health and nutrition, what they think should be done to improve their communities. So one type of our youth engagement work is student nutrition action councils or SNAP clubs, which we're just starting up with um, elementary aged youth. Uh, we also are conducting teens as teachers work. Both of these interventions are in partnership with the 4-H program. Um, and this allows older youth to become teachers uh, of our approved CalFresh Healthy Living curriculum and provide education to younger students, but they also learn a lot of critical skills along the way. Um, but what I really wanna focus on is something mentioned in a couple of the prior presentations, um, youth participatory action research. Um, this uh, pictured here is actually a group of students from a couple years ago showcasing a community mapping project that they completed as part of this YPAR model. And YPAR is basically a framework for guiding youth to ask their own questions about community health and nutrition and work with them to create PSC changes in their communities. Um, so in YPAR, I really want to emphasize it's not just about a specific project. I could show lots of examples of wonderful specific YPAR projects, but I really think what's important about this is it's the process that youth get to go through in these projects where they learn to think about their environments critically um, as much as they are learning how to, how to complete a specific project. Um, they really learn to understand their environment as a, a factor that affects their health. Um, so YPAR is a wonderful model for those of us working within CalFresh Healthy Living who want to do community-engaged work with youth. Um, it's already an approved research-backed program. Um, it is supported by the Stepping Stones curriculum. And if you'd like to learn more about it, I've included a link for more information in the resources section of this presentation. So if you click on that, um, it should take you to more information. And I also want to thank... Um, our CalFresh Healthy Living UC State Office and the UC Davis Center for Regional Change for their huge support for this programming. Uh, in the future, um, we hope to move forward potentially, or at least explore working with adults in some of these new ways. Um, while our program has worked with adults in the past, um, we really are hoping that our return to in-person is a good opportunity to start out um, engaging adults in new ways. Um, and I'd really like to see if some of the lessons and techniques from YPAR might be useful to work with groups of adults as well, um, specifically to do community-engaged PSE work. Um, obviously, we always work with partners uh, to do PSC work. It's not something we usually do alone. But I think that being intentional about how we approach groups of adults as stakeholders and truly as experts in their own communities, not just as participants in our predetermined plans, um, I think that's really important. And I think we may be able to take some of the lessons and the types of supports from the YPAR, the youth structure, um, and apply them to groups of adults as well. So we will see where that takes us. 
Um, that kind of concludes my example, but I know we've talked a lot about uh, this topic today, and I want to acknowledge it can be really overwhelming to think about the scope of work we have to do to move the needle on health disparities. Um, but I do want to leave everyone with a few concrete steps that I hope we could all take, every LIA or every program, if we aren't already doing some of these. And the first is to use your data. Again, we have data available. Um, we can look at it. And, um, you know, as I talked about at the beginning, we can't address disparities if we don't know where they are. Sometimes they're obvious, and sometimes we have to do some work to uncover them. Second, we can assess our program resources. What do you need to do? What do you need to be able to do this work, right? So some questions, um, there are many you could ask, but some might be, are the materials you want available in appropriate languages? Does your agency compensate bilingual speakers for the skills they bring to your program? Does your leadership recognize the need to target disparities? Um, Finally, we can assess our programming and really think critically about how we can move more from serving communities to engaging communities. Um, we all made plans for community engagement in our IWPs, and thank you to CDSS and the SIAs for including community engagement in our CalFresh Healthy Living IWPs. Um, but how has that translated into action, and what's the connection between listening to our communities and actually implementing programming? So finally, I just wanna to end today on um, hopefully an optimistic note, which is that collectively, CalFresh Healthy Living is a powerful force in California. We have uh, a lot of power and a lot of funding throughout the state. There really are not a lot, if any, other programs that bring this level of support for community health to the state year after year after year in communities. Um, and I really believe that if we work together, we can make a lot of progress. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for listening today. I'd like to thank my whole team um, and all of our many, many community partners out there. And we have one final poll that I'd like everyone to answer based not just on what I said, but um, for all of the speakers who spoke today. So based on what you've heard, will you modify your program to focus more on addressing disparities? And I think we may have a couple um, questions that have come into the Q&A. So um, I'm also gonna open that up if anyone does have um, any questions they'd like to put in there. And Andrew Nickley, I think may jump back in here as well to facilitate that. Yes. Thank you, Katie. Um, we do have a question, Katie, uh, from South Lake Tahoe. Do you coordinate any efforts with the Washoe County, Nevada, to possibly expand similar efforts to North Lake Tahoe? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, Tahoe is split. It's actually a community that is divided by a state line in many ways. Um, the short answer is we don't have an integrated work plan with Nevada SNAP-Ed. Um, so we don't necessarily directly coordinate our CalFresh Healthy Living UC activities. However, part of our project there, the one I mentioned that's um, covering the snack clubs, it is done through another source of grant funding in part, um, the 4-H Children, Youth, Families, and Risk uh, funding stream. And we are working with Nevada SNAP-Ed on that program. Um, they don't have a lot of active programming in Washoe County right now, but, um, but we are working with Nevada that way. Do we have any other questions at this time for our presenters? Please feel free to put questions in the Q&A widget. I'm not seeing any questions at this time. I'd like to thank Juliet McMullen, Jennifer Sowerwine, Chatima Ganthavon, and Katie Johnson for presenting today, and to all our viewers. 
We hope this session has been informative and that it enhances your view of trauma-informed community engagement. We also hope it inspires you in your very important community work with CalFresh Healthy Living programs. As mentioned in our introduction, we both live history, but we also make history. In the course of our lives and through our actions and deeds and practices, through policies and through programs. While our communities live history, we can also help them shape a future that is healthier. And Katie, thank you for some final thoughts. There is a session evaluation and you'll receive this in your email this afternoon. There are also CEU credits and please to remember to enjoy our on-demand activities at the forum, the exhibitor hall, the posters and physical activity videos, which I think we're all about to go to. I do think I have one more question. Uh, no, this is the same one. So I think we are at conclusion. Thank you all, appreciate your time with us and hope this session has been informative to you.